Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at uh, Mount Royal's um, incredible campus. Always a pleasure for me personally to be back on campus. Some of my very first steps, I think actually, indeed, my very first steps in post-secondary education were here at Mount Royal. Uh, and so it's always a true uh, pleasure and privilege to be back. Um, I'm very happy to introduce and welcome uh, Premier Kenny to make a, you know, an important announcement this morning. Premier? Actually, uh, three important announcements, Demetrius. Uh, but thank you very much, Minister Nicolaides, and thanks to the whole team here at Mount Royal University for welcoming us for important announcements, announcements about expanding Alberta's healthcare capacity better to serve uh, Albertans. We all know that the last two and a half years put uh, unprecedented strain on our public health care system. Uh, the public health crisis unmasked a serious uh, lack of capacity in not just the Alberta, but the entire Canadian healthcare system. In fact, we see that right around the world. We also see with the aging of the population, the retirement of the boomers, the silver tsunami, on top of all the pressure and burnout coming from COVID, that health systems here and around the world are struggling to cope, increasingly experiencing shortages uh, amongst healthcare workers. Alberta's government is taking real action to address these challenges, to expand capacity, to ensure that a hospital bed is there for people when they need it and where they need it. There are no simple, easy, silver bullet solutions to this. It's going to take hard work and a partnership between uh, educational institutions, the right immigration policies, of course, adequate government funding, and of course, support for the fantastic frontline professionals who deliver uh, high quality health care in hospitals and clinics across our province every single day. And that's why Alberta's government has significantly increased Alberta's health care budget, but the baseline budget having gone up by over $2 billion over the past three years, in addition to about $3 billion of extra spending to support the system and patients through the COVID years. Uh, coming out, we had to learn lessons. Coming out of COVID, we had to learn critical lessons about the shortage in capacity. And let's be honest about it. Alberta and every province in Canada, under different governments of different stripes uh, for decades, has closely rationed the availability of beds and care uh, to avoid building excess capacity uh, because uh, of the, the cost of, of operating the system and the need to put, put, to put resources to where they are most urgently needed. But we recognized in Alberta a particular uh, shortage in intensive care uh, unit beds. And that really uh, made COVID particularly challenging in terms of health capacity in Alberta. That's why uh, we committed about nine months ago to create uh, 50 additional fully funded and staffed intensive care beds in Alberta hospitals. Today, I am pleased to report that that goal has been achieved. That commitment has been kept and there are 50 new fully funded ICU beds available for, for Alberta patients across hospitals in the province. That's a big step forward. It represents uh, an investment of 300 million additional tax dollars over three years that were in, in this year's budget. It's a 29% increase in the number of ICU beds available, which is by far the largest increase in Alberta healthcare history. It uh, represents 335 additional staff uh, to support those ICU beds. So that's an average of, of nearly seven staff uh, per ICU bed. Of course, those beds, uh, by definition, they require intensive support and they have to be available to operate around the clock 24 seven. But I can also report, and Minister Copping will provide more details, that uh, if those beds are not in use for critical care, uh, that, that then the staff will be available for other high priority needs in the healthcare system uh, this is about having the smart and right allocation of resources, but it also means that Alberta will not be caught short should we ever face uh, a series of unexpected uh, crises like we did a year ago. Uh, I have some other important news because while that additional funding is, uh, has been helpful, we want to thank uh, all of the administrators for having delivered on this commitment to increase uh, critical care capacity by nearly 30%. The fundamental underlying challenge in our system right now relates to uh, the healthcare workforce. And as I said, there are a number of demographic fact, uh, trends that are beyond the control of government. 
that, are, that we're experiencing across uh, Canada and the developed world. The aging of the population, many experienced doctors and nurses who are taking retirement. Many have taken earlier retirement than initially planned because of uh, the stress and burnout from COVID. And of course, Alberta's population is growing, growing uh, at an unprecedented rate in the second quarter of this year. According to Statistics Canada, Alberta saw the fastest, highest population growth over a three-month period at any time it, for, it, that we have statistics. In fact, we, we grew by a net uh, of over uh, uh, 40,000 in, in the second quarter of this year. And here's my prediction. With the youngest population in the country and the highest birth rate, with a uh, huge uh, migration of Canadians to Alberta because they're they're hearing that Alberta is calling and they want an affordable living with low taxes and a strong economy we are going to continue to see a uh, huge interprovincial migration of people to to Alberta we welcome them with open arms we need them we need their skills but I think we're also set to get an even larger share of uh, inbound immigration from around the world Alberta has 12% of the country's population. Uh, we typically receive 16% of the new immigrants coming to Canada as primary uh, immigrants coming to Alberta. Our goal is to hit 20% of immigrants to Canada choosing Alberta as their first home. All, all said, I believe Alberta's population will be growing by 100,000 a year for the foreseeable years in part because of our uh, exciting economic renaissance. All of that means more people that need more health care needing more doctors and nurses while we're facing the challenge of retirement at the other end. And so we need uh, to leave no stone unturned in getting more people into uh, programs like here at Mount Royal University to be trained as nurses. Uh, and we need all, as well uh, to get our immigration policies right. That's what I'm pleased to announce, that uh, we've been working with the government of the Philippines over the past several months to establish an agreement to make Alberta a preferred destination uh, for inbound uh, Filipino nurses who are in demand all around the world because of their remarkably high skill, their culture of compassion. I think every Albertan uh, knows uh, probably several uh, Albertans of Filipino origin who have been working in our healthcare sector, many of them were the mainstay of uh, as healthcare aides and long-term care homes, nurses in our hospitals, and we are so grateful for the passion and work ethic they've brought to this country. As Canada's immigration minister, uh, I, I'm proud that one of my legacies was to see Philippines become the top source country of immigrants to Canada and of some uh, very large and vibrant community in Alberta. But we want to see that, that Alberta is a, a, pl a destination of choice amongst highly trained and well-educated Filipino nurses. However, when they come here, they often have, like most immigrants do, challenges getting their credentials recognized so they can get to work at their skill level. Practically, this means that we have many registered nurses who receive their degrees in Philippines who end up working as, as healthcare aides, struggling to get their d degrees and credentials recognized. And this is true for people not just from Philippines but across the world. And we're going to hear from uh, one such person I think later today. That's why we have here at Mount Royal University a bridging program uh, funded by the government of Alberta that takes people with that level of international education, adds some supplementary courses and training modules so that they can more quickly get their credentials to work at a hospital as a fully certified registered nurse. And uh, so today I'm pleased to announce that we will be signing a memorandum of understanding with the government of Philippines after months of negotiation that will uh, be a real difference maker in uh, attracting more highly educated uh, Filipino and Filipino nurses here. They will have access to navigating the co our complex regulatory system uh, to help the navigating it rather. They will get streamlined assessments and licensing programs. They'll have greater access to bridging seats and clinical placements. Uh, they'll have a bursary program to help with costs associated with credentialing here. And there will be options for further partnerships, including the potential to establish an Alberta accredited nursing program in the Philippines. And that's something we're very excited about. Now, this is an important step forward with Philippines. Of course, Alberta will be open to similar agreements with other countries that have been an important source of talented newcomers to our country. 
And then secondly, I'm pleased to announce additional funding today for a program to help internationally trained nurses get their credentials by expanding programs like this one at MRU that offer bridging. Right now, there can be a very long wait list for those experienced and educated international nurses to get their credentials. They need a bridging program like this. There's a backlog. Uh, today, uh, millions of dollars of additional funding will, will help to reduce those, uh, the, the number of seats and reduce the backlog. All of this is on top of the actions taken in Budget 2022 uh, that have increased uh, by 2,000 the number of spaces available in Alberta post-secondary institutions uh, for nurse training. Uh, and uh, the truth is this, that despite all of the challenges, we have more nurses and more doctors working in Alberta's healthcare system today uh, than ever before. We are spending more on healthcare than ever before. We spend more than almost every province in Canada on healthcare. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, I th I'm very grateful to say that we have achieved uh, positive outcomes in our collective bargaining with all of the public sector healthcare unions, including the nurses union, uh, and most recently was delighted to see the ratification of a new agreement with the Alberta Medical Association with a 70% ratification vote. So all of those represent important progress, but more needs to be done, and that is action that we're taking here today. And with that, I'm looking forward to hearing from Minister Nicolaides. Well, thank you, Premier and uh, uh, Minister Copping. Thank you for joining us here today as well. Um, Mount Royal President Tim Raleigh, thank you for being here, as well as uh, Consul Zaldi Patron and uh, Hannah, our uh, student that we'll be hearing from in, in a few short minutes. Um, as the Premier discussed, internationally educated nurses face significant barriers to come live and work here in Alberta. The process can often be long and complicated. First, their skills are evaluated by the College of Registered Nurses of Alberta and the College of Licensed Practical Nurses of Alberta who regulate the nursing profession. These bodies then identify that uh, oftentimes most internationally educated nurses will require additional training. Following this, they can apply for a, b a bridging program. These are offered by Bow Valley College, McEwen University, Mount Royal University, Northwest College, and the University of Alberta, and are targeted at internationally educated nurses requ requiring varying degrees of additional training. After they have finished their bridging education, they will then undergo further assessment and licensing to finally be able to practice at their skill level. Internationally educated nurses face predominant financial barriers as well throughout this process. On top of the costs associated with moving to a new country, internationally educated nurses have to pay thousands of dollars to navigate the regulatory process and receive supplementary training. They also face barriers to access. It was noted recently by the Fairness for Newcomers Office earlier this year that internationally educated nurses do not have adequate access to education required for them to become nurses in Alberta. It's no coincidence that we are here today as Mount Royal is indeed the only post-secondary institution in Alberta that offers the full Bridge to Canadian Nursing Program, which currently operates at approximately 120 seats. But this program and other bridging programs around the province are in incredibly high demand. Mount Royal's program is also in high demand with the capacity to admit 120 per year, but usually more applicants apply than the program is able to accept. Those who did not get admitted have to wait until the next intake cycle and may apply several times before being admitted. This issue, of course, is not unique to Mount Royal, and many internationally educated nurses wait for years to be admitted. I learned uh, earlier this morning that several years ago, I think it was back in 2017-18, uh, Mount Royal saw a peak of almost 400 applicants uh, for these 120 spaces. I understand that has since slowed down, but 
uh, nonetheless, there continues to be a wait list. And so we must do better. And that is why advanced education, health, lab health and labor and immigration are working together to make it easier for internationally educated nurses to come to Alberta. And I'm happy to announce that advanced education will be investing 3.45 million to expand nurse bridging programs at our post-secondary institutions. We are reducing barriers for internationally educated nurses to come to Alberta and we will ensure our healthcare system remains strong both now and into the future. Today's investment is one of the first actions being taken to attract more internationally educated nurses to Alberta. Today's investment will, of course, expand seats in these high demand bridging programs, which is, of course, great news for Mount Royal. And as I said before, they, have, they offer one of the most comprehensive bridging programs in Alberta. By expanding uh, bridging programs at institutions across the province, we can make more space and ensure more individuals are able to access these needed programs. Furthermore, the investment, as Premier noted, follows uh, a recent expansion in post-secondary education. Earlier this spring, we announced $171 million in new funding over three years to our institutions to create 10,000 additional spaces. Over 2,000 of these, as Premier noted, were created in healthcare-related fields. As well, we are also taking steps to develop a bursary program to support internationally educated nurses. The costs associated with training and the regulatory process can exceed up to $16,000 for many internationally educated nurses. And this creates financial barriers for many of them who are already experiencing financial strain from moving to a new country. And so this new bursary that is being developed will award internationally educated nurses up to 15,500 to help them reduce the obstacles uh, that are in front of them with respect to licensing and further education. This new strategy from advanced education, health and labor and immigration will benefit Albertans by ensuring the province remains competitive and attractive. More information will be available online and come shortly, and I'm very happy to pass things over to my colleague, Minister Copping, to talk more about the steps that are being taken by the Ministry of Health. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Minister Nicolaitis. It's great to be here back at uh, Mount Royal University. It's, it's been a long time since I taught labor relations here, but uh, I, I, got a, I got an offer earlier on. I'm, I'm always welcome to come back, so I may take you up on that down the road. I just want to say a huge thank you uh, to the Premier, to Council Patron, to uh, Minister Nicolaitis for their work and their tremendous support of our health care system. As you all know, nurses are the backbone of our health care system. And I'd like to also thank all the nurses and other healthcare providers for the work that they do in our system each and every day. International recruitment has always been a competitive field. And now, more than ever, because everyone is facing the same challenges, the Premier mentioned this, the challenges being faced here in Alberta in terms of finding staff are not unique to Alberta. In fact, it's across the country and across the entire first world. More patients who need care and a workforce that's strained by two and a half years of pandemic. We need to get into the competition for international nurses and we need to win it. But of course we need to do much more. We need to make sure we can recruit and retain great people across the board. And we're doing that with a record $22 billion health budget, 1.6 billion more than in 2018, 2019, and increasing by 600 million each year for three years. Now, that budget is supporting new collective agreements for the health workforce. Since January, AHS has signed new agreements with RNs, LPNs, paramedical and technical professionals, and support staff as well. And of course, as the Premier mentioned just last week, doctors ratified a new agreement with the AMA. Those agreements include competitive wages and other compensation, so they're part of the foundation for recruitment and retention. And we are recruiting people as fast as AHS can hire them. They hired 90% of Alberta nursing graduates in the past year alone. They have 1,900 more RNs and 300 more paramedics today than in 2019. And they're adding over 1,000 more frontline staff this year alone. 
We're hiring today and we're planning for the future. With another crucial investment from Minister Nicolaitis, $31 million in new funding to add 2,600 seats and training programs for RNs, healthcare aides, and others across the province. And this is part of the largest post-secondary training expansion in our province's history. So again, Minister Nicolaitis and Premier, thank you. But the fact is, we need more nurses and other healthcare professionals, and we need them now. So we're working with post-secondary institutions and licensing bodies to streamline the process for healthcare professionals trained in other countries to work right here in Alberta. We're sending a message. Healthcare is still a great career in spite of the strain of the pandemic, and Alberta is the best place in Canada to build it. And we're not just talking the talk. As mentioned by the, uh, Minister Nicolaitis uh, and the Premier, I am also pleased to announce today that Alberta Health will invest half a million dollars this year to create a program to guide internationally educated nurses through the licensing process. We'll develop a one-stop online platform that will make it easier to find information on where to go to be licensed, links to regulatory colleges, bridging programs like this one here at MRU, financial support, and other resources. We know that the human connection is important when you're trying to figure out a process. So as part of that program, we are creating new roles for nurse navigators to help internationally trained nurses through the process, both here in Alberta and in countries where the candidates are coming from. Another key piece in this process is to help candidates secure clinical placement that can be part of the bridging program. And AHS has committed to providing access to those placements, so that's yet another step forward. And my department is working with licensing bodies, the College of Registered Nurses and the College of Practical Nurses to streamline the licensing process itself. The College of Physicians and Surgeons just this week announced a change to speed up the assessment process for international medical graduates. And the nursing colleges are also looking at changes they can make to get international nurses licensed and safely into practice faster, and I'm grateful for their commitment. One option they're exploring is to align their assessments for RNs and LPNs with a process designed by the National Community Ass Assessment Service in line with the change made by some other provinces so there will be a single application, a single fee, and a single assessment for accreditation. And we will continue to work on ways with the colleges and others to speed up the process and get nurses to where we need them across our province. The other good piece of news that the Premier just announced is 50 new ICU beds. These beds are now staffed in a, and available in 12 hospitals in Red Deer, Calgary, Lethbridge, Edmonton, St. Albert, Fort McMurray, and Grand Prairie. This boosts ICU capacity by 29%. Now, it's ICU if, ne if necessary, not necessarily ICU. When the beds are not in use, the nurses and other staff assigned to them will support other areas of the hospital. The pandemic has shown that we need more permanent capacity and we need more staff, and we need to be flexible with those resources. Now, we made a commitment to add ICU beds. We funded it, and now we've delivered on it. And we'll keep working to deliver on our overall promise to Albertans, a stronger, publicly funded health system with higher capacity and shorter wait times. The system and the people who work in it are under real strain, as they are in every province and in many First Nations around the world. But the system is there for the people who need it. And we're making progress and adding capacity. In addition to the new ICU beds, 19 new ambulances are on the road out of the 20 that were funded in budget 2022 to be added over the next two years. We're doing more cancer surgery and more cataract surgery than before the pandemic, more CTI and MRI scans, more home care and more placements into continuing care. Access to all those services is actually better today than it was in 2018-19 before COVID. But this doesn't change the fact that the system still remains under real strain, especially in emergency and EMS services. And we are investing to add capacity and changing how we deliver healthcare service. But getting there will take time. But we're doing that work with a record budget and concrete actions to add capacity across the system, like some of the actions that we've announced here today. And we'll stick at it until we deliver on the promise made to Albertans a stronger publicly funded healthcare system with better access to care. So thank you. And I'm now I'd like to call upon a bridging nursing student here at the program at MRU, Hannah Sayuni. Uh, 
Uh, good morning, everyone. And first of all, thank you for having me in here. My name is Hannah Sahyuni. I'm a student at uh, Mount Royal, the Bridge to Canadian Nursing Program. Uh, I came from Lebanon seven years ago. Uh, I worked as an ICU RN for four years. Uh, I also did my master's and finished in 2016. Uh, I came to Canada, you know, seeking a better life opportunity and dreaming to work in uh, one of the leading public health systems in the world. Uh, my dream was to go into advanced practice. Uh, that was fairly new in Lebanon. It was going on for years here, so I came, I came to gain an experience. But because of the licensing process, I've been out of practice for more than seven years now. I applied uh, to the program at Mount Royal in 2017. I wasn't able to get in until January 2022. Yeah, so um, expanding the, the program, that's great news for us as IENs. Uh, it will definitely make a huge difference in the lives of many new Albertans. And uh, it's a decision, I believe it's good for the public of everybody in Alberta because you're increasing the nursing workforce. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, I want to add one more thing. The bridging program at Mount Royal is a great program. It uh, definitely introduces nurses into professional nursing in Canada. Uh, so thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I am Consul General Zaldi Patron of the Philippine Consulate General in Calgary. On behalf of the government of the Philippines, I would like to extend my appreciation to Premier Jason Kenney and the government of Alberta for signing this Philippines-Alberta Memorandum of Understanding on the recruitment of Filipino nurses. This MOU which has provisions for the streamlining of the accreditation and licensing process, the delivery of the nursing bridging program in the Philippines through accredited institutions and online format, and assistance through financial incentives will be a big help for our Filipino nurses in the Philippines who are thinking of coming to Alberta, and for the Filipino nurses who are already here in Canada but are still unregistered. Our Filipino nurses are world-class and are known for their competence, work ethics, and compassion. This MOU will provide them the opportunity to reach their full professional and human potentials here in Alberta. With more Filipino nurses able to practice as registered nurses in this province, they will provide the much needed boost and energy for Alberta's healthcare system. I salute Premier Kenny for showing decisive leadership as he brought together the ministries of health, advanced education, and labor and immigration during our negotiations so we can finalize this MOU and sign it today. Alberta is the first Canadian province to sign this kind of MOU with the Philippines. On the Philippine side, I would like to thank our newly created Department of Migrant Workers, or DMW, headed by Secretary Susan Ople, the DMW signatory to this MOU under Secretary Patricia Yvonne Kaunan, Labor Attaché Jainal Rasul of our Philippine Overseas Labor Office in Vancouver, my colleagues in the Office of the President, the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Philippine Post in Canada, and the Philippine Consulate General in Calgary for working tirelessly with me since last year so we can finally reach this stage. This bilateral agreement is also part of the desire of the administration of the newly elected President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. to promote the welfare of overseas Filipinos wherever they are. This MOU, this partnership, will be a win-win for the Philippines and Alberta. 
thank you, and as we say in the Philippines, mabuhay. And also, as you say in the Philippines, salamat po. Salamat po. Thank you so much, Consul General. Uh, you, uh, Consul General brought uh, his ambassador to visit with me in the spring, and they presented this bold vision of making Alberta a preferred destination uh, for uh, highly educated Filipino nurses. Uh, I don't think people understand how difficult it is. To, at first, we were told it might take 18 months to get to an agreement. Um, and uh, we've managed to get this done in about four months. And that took a lot of hard work and leadership on your, you had to bug all of your colleagues back in Manila. And I had to bug my ministers and officials too. It's worth it, Mr. It, it worked. It, it's worked. It, it yeah. worked. It's worth it. And I am so happy to hear that Alberta is the first in Canada to sign this agreement. Like usual, Alberta is leading Canada. It is. Yeah. So, with that, I'm going to uh, sign this agreement, and you can uh, transmit this back uh, to uh, to the Department of uh, Migrant Workers and your colleagues in Manila. And, you know, I, I'll just say on a personal note, uh, one of the great privileges of my 25 years in public service was being Canada's longest ever serving Minister of Immigration. Uh, and all we, one of my great joys in life is meeting people who came to Canada during my tenure as Minister of Immigration. And I am just thrilled that one of my last acts as in public service uh, is signing an agreement that will welcome uh, more wonderful, hardworking, highly skilled new Albertans and new Canadians uh, to uh, to help us build this great place. So thank you so much, Consul General. Thank you so much to uh, Mr. Premier, and uh, this MOU will be uh, again another legacy for you with the Filipino community. Thank you, we appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. That concludes the formal portion of our event. We're going to move to a media Q&A. There's a media mic right there for those of you in the room who have a question. Please line up, identify your name, outlet, who you'd like to direct your question to, and limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Hi, it's Colleen Underwood with CBC News. I have so many questions. I can't believe you're... <laughs> there was so much information here. Um, and then, of course, I have one unrelated question. Um, so I'll just start with, can you, so from what I understand, so you're doing uh, a relation, uh, an agreement with the Philippines to help bring more Philippine, uh, Filipino workers specifically, but then you're also investing in the bridge program generally. Just kind of summarize, because it was a big long. Yeah, uh, it was long. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, no, We're trying to pack a lot in here. Yeah. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is, um, we had about a, a nearly two week period during which we could not make government an announcements because of the demise of uh, Her Late Majesty. So uh, we're, we're having to make up for, for that period of time. But also this agreement was just uh, finalized in the last few days. Uh, so just to tr try to make it really simple here on, on the international nurses, uh, this is a, an agreement with Philippines uh, that Alberta will provide uh, assistance to streamline the process for Filipino nurses coming here, make it easier for them to get into bridging programs, have access to bursaries uh, that will uh, be able to report back on their progress through uh, Alberta's system, uh, and that um, Philippines will uh, make Alberta a, a preferred destination because their nurses are in demand all around the world. And the Philippine government wants to make sure that their nurses and generally that their migrants go to welcoming host societies that respect their rights, pay them fairly, uh, and, uh, and let them get to work at their skill level. Because the truth of, is that in, in, many, in some parts of the world, uh, migrant workers, immigrants, uh, Filipinos 
uh, don't enjoy all of those rights. So this gives the Filipino government the ability to say uh, to, in this case, their nurses that if you go to Alberta, we're confident you'll be well treated. They'll get you uh, your credentials as quickly as they reasonably can. They'll get you into a bridging program, and they'll they'll help to pave the process. So that's in that's in, in plain English what the agreement does. It's a it's kind of a, a bridge between Philippines and Canada to speed it up. I wanted to say, Hannah, I'm so sorry, but your seven years, it's experiences like yours that uh, make me deeply frustrated. That Canada invites highly educated and experienced people such as yourself here only to be on the sidelines while your skills atrophy and you wait and wait and wait, often burning through your savings, too often stuck in survival jobs. <sighs> I, uh, it, it, it grieves and frustrates me that Canada has not yet solved this problem because we, uh, you deserved better and Canada deserved the benefit of your skills so I hope that today's measures will be a, a step forward. The other measures that we are announcing today to help people in Hannah's situation is to expand the number of bridging uh, uh, programs at places like Mount Royal so that um, uh, when, when uh, foreign trained nurses approach uh, the, the, college, the College of Nurses and they say, you know, we don't think you, you have quite the right Canadian training, we add a program like this adds additional training at the Canadian, in the Canadian system uh, so that folks like Hannah can more quickly get their credentials. So these two things are working together, Sp specific focus on the Philippines, but the expansion of bridging program will, will support all of the internationally trained nurses and our healthcare system. I hope that sums it up. That does. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a follow-up, Colleen? I do, and this one is for Minister Coffin. Um I just wanted to ask about um, the data problems with the COVID data. So just looking at, and I'm just gonna read the question. Uh, what's the specific nature of the data flow problem that's led to the cancellation of this week's COVID update? And what would you say to folks who say Albertans have a right to have access to that information ahead of a weekend when people will be gathering? Yeah, so we're working on it as quickly as possible. I don't know the exact nature of the why the data didn't flow correctly. Um, we got the reports, the numbers weren't right. So we're going back to, to find out why the numbers uh, aren't right. Um, and we're working on it right now. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get it out, um, like be able to correct it within uh, hours and days, but I can't make a commitment uh, only in as much as because we don't know what the issue is. Uh, but you know, what I, you know, people deserve to have that information. Yes, I agree. Uh, we're working on it as quickly as we can. Um, you know, my sense in terms of the, the COVID numbers, when we, when we take a step back, you know, the numbers were, you know, in hospital uh, roughly, you know, 930 last week. Um, you know, we are seeing a, uh, um, you know, when we look at the, the um, wastewater data, uh, particularly in Calgary, uh, it's coming down. Others like Edmonton, it's, it's fairly flat. Same with the positivity rate from last year, so that, or from last week. So that suggests that, you know, it may be ticking up a little bit um, or, or staying relatively level, um, but we're working on it as fast as we can. We'll get it fixed and we'll report back to Albertans when it's done. Okay, thank thank you. you. Are there any other questions on the floor? Go ahead. Hi, Austin Lee with CTV News. Uh, this one's for the Premier. And unfortunately, it is off topic. Shocking. I apologize. Shocking. Yeah. <laughs> Bit of a busy day today. Um, I guess my question is just how are you feeling? I mean, obviously, a big day for provincial politics, a uh, new premier, premier coming up pretty soon here. How are you feeling? Just the emotions, I guess. Uh, I'm feeling great. I, I'm just doing my job. I'm trying to deliver on our commitments to Albertans uh, as long as I have this responsibility. So, uh, uh, I'm grateful, as, as I said yesterday, for, to have had the privilege of 25 years in public service. I'm grateful over the past uh, nearly four years to have had the best job uh, in Canada, the best job of my life, uh, to lead the best place in the best country on earth. And uh, so I am uh, I'm grateful uh, to have worked with a, with a fantastic team, and I am really grateful and happy to see this province backfiring on just about every cylinder. Uh, we've got, uh, you know, yesterday we made another historic announcement, uh, a huge game-changing expansion of air service for Alberta. We will, Calgary will now be the best served uh, city of under 2 million people in North America for uh, air passengers. 
a doubling of WestJet's capacity, $7 billion investment uh, that will create thousands of jobs. Uh, that's for me, and, and today's announcement, these are capstones uh, in a way that shows real tangible progress. I, uh, believe me, I didn't get into politics for the adulation. Um, <laughs> I, I got into public service to get things done, and that's why I'm, I'm, I got up this morning to come here to get things done. Follow up. And I, you know, I got to say, if, if, if on this, some people say, well, why don't you just uh, gear down in the past few months, or why did you stick around in the past few months? Well, because we have a, had a lot of work to do, and there still is. And uh, if uh, we had shifted to an interim government for five months, very little would have gotten done. There would have been transition and files would have to get restarted and things would fall between the cracks. And then you have a new government getting sworn and all of that would happen. The province would have gone through a degree of policy paralysis for the better part of six months. Uh, just as we're trying to recover from COVID, we're probably in the, in the middle of a global recession and with huge uh, challenges. So I, I, quite frankly, think I made the right call, as did my team, to uh, continue getting the job done every single day. Um, and we're now at having delivered 93% of our platform commitments. We continue to see the economic progress. I mean, just think about one of the things we've launched in the last few months is the uh, Alberta is Calling campaign, uh, which is helping to fuel talented new Albertans coming here. So I'm, I'm, I'm pumped about the progress we've, been, we've made over three and a half years, and in fact, over the past three and a half months. Go ahead. Uh, just kind of building off of that, uh, that issue with the COVID data, um, just wondering your thoughts on the timing of that matter, given everything going on today and ahead of the long weekend. I, well, I think when there are technical problems with reporting data and computer systems, it, it those, those things happen occasionally, certainly not the first time in the two and a half years of reporting COVID data that there's been a technical glitch. And I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch of IT people who worked all the way around the clock trying to sort that out. Um, and I will entrust Minister Copping's team and the folks at Public Health will get that solved as soon as possible. Uh, but I mean, if, if the implication of the questions are something political about that, it's ridiculous. Um, Elected people, don't, we don't come within a country mile of how or where that data is collected. These are all uh, happen deep, deep in, t in the system. Um, and um, I, again, I would refer technical questions on that to public health, yeah. We have time for one more. Operator, can you please put through our last caller? Alex Antonition, CTV. Hi there, my, my question is for the Advanced Education Minister. Uh, can you explain what the impetus was for the overhaul of Athabasca University's Board of Governors, um, and how will this affect the conversation between the school and the province about where staff live and, and the school's funding? Uh, sure. Uh, sorry, I had a little trouble hearing the question, but uh, I heard it was uh, with respect to Athabasca University and some of the recent changes that we've made to the Board of Governors. Um, of course, as you know, the government of Alberta appoints the board chair and the majority of members uh, to uh, the boards of all of our public post-secondary institutions. And uh, I think, as you know, at the end of March, we asked the university to build a strategy that will get executive and administrative operations um, solidly back in the town of Athabasca. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not entirely a new direction. The institution has operated from a base of operations in Athabasca for several decades. The previous governments in the 80s moved the university very deliberately from Edmonton to Athabasca for a very particular reason. And so we want to ensure that that original vision and original foundation is still front and center in the university's mandate. Um, and of course, uh, when there's uh, a, re, um, uh, a, a refreshing of an institution's mandate or an organization's mandate, that oftentimes requires a uh, new skill level at the board, at the leadership level, that oftentimes requires um, new, new eyes and ears. The folks that we've recently uh, appointed uh, all have a strong uh, connection uh, in, in some way or another to the university or the region more broadly. They understand the dynamics of the region and the community and will be able to bring that expertise 
to the assistance of the executive team at the university so that we can develop some uh, robust strategies and solutions that will help ensure, again, executive and administrative operations have uh, a home base in the town of Athabasca. Do you have a follow-up, Alex? No, thank you. Thanks, everyone. That concludes our press conference.